The audio you're about to hear was recorded in Anchor. Learn more at anchor.fm. All right, welcome back to the Schmidt Podcast. This is episode 007, Introduction to Homer's Iliad. And so what we're going to do today is what I've been meaning to do all along. Um, as some of you may know as listeners, I'm a teacher. I teach uh, a great books curriculum that I developed out in San Diego. And where I start the freshmen is with Homer's Iliad at the very beginning of their journey. Eventually, uh, uh, in the first two years of the Great Books program, they will read all five of the major epics of Western civilization as defined by Mortimer Adler, Homer's Iliad, Homer's Odyssey, uh, Virgil's Aeneid, Dante's Divine Comedy, the whole thing, not just the Inferno, and Paradise Lost by John Milton, with a smattering of philosophy by Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas, um, and a little bit of theater as well. Sophocles, sometimes Euripides, and Aeschylus, depending on the teacher's preference. So keeping in line also with what we talked about yesterday in terms of safe spaces and defining safe spaces in the Jordan Peterson terms of mapped territory, that which you have seen and now understand, and unmapped territory, that which you have never seen and therefore do not understand and don't know how to act in such a situation, we're going to apply that terminology to this series of lectures writ large. I'm going to talk about the great books and the realiz- and their relation to civilization and how the great books illustrate the alteration of unmapped space into mapped space as the human consciousness progresses through difficult ethical decisions. And so... That will be the major thesis or hypothesis of the course that the great books illustrate the growth of Western consciousness. And so, well, we might as well dive in. Homer's Iliad. Homer's Iliad is the first story of Western civilization. It's the first story of Western civilization in that it is a story about not only war, but a conflict that exists within war, showing you the particular pugnacious nature of we who are humans. Not only do we get into wars with those who are not parts of our in-groups, we get into major wars with those who are parts of our in-groups. So who is it that we meet at Troy at odds? We meet the mighty Trojans, an, an Asiatic people made up of many differing peoples with many different Languages, and they stand against the mighty Achaeans. And who are the Achaeans? Well, the Achaeans are the Greeks, and they are sometimes called the Achaeans, the Argives, and the Danaeans. Why are they called by so many different names? Well, they too come from many different parts of a large mainland called Argos and the islands around it. And so, generally, I will call them the Achaeans because that's the name I most frequently see in the Iliad. I will never call them Greeks because Though the Greek people did come from them, they were not at that time called Greeks because they were not a unified nation. And so you might understand that this major war between uh, the Achaeans and Troy causing so many manifold peoples to come together with a unified goal was that which first drew enough people to the same idea in order to create a nation. And that seems to be why we've maintained this text, because that seems to be clearly true. And in fact, a few things you might notice about the Achaeans versus the Trojans, and several scholars say that this is because Homer has a a Greek or a Hellenic bias. Yes, possibly true, seeing as he did sing in ancient Greek, and you should know that Homer did not most likely write down these texts, though when he was alive, writing was just re-entering the abilities of the uh, Greek peoples. He he was singing. He was a rhapsode or an aoidoi, a traveling singer, and so he had this he had the story memorized, which is fairly incredible. But having taught the story now for several years, I can see how uh, one would be able to memorize the story practicing it every day, singing it almost every day for many, many years. It uh, it would be very difficult, but, well, humans can do very difficult things. And so, well, Homer most likely sang this song going about in the 8th century, and the story itself is set in sometime around the 12th century. 
And so Homer's singing in the 8th century, somewhere between 750 B.C., B.C., and uh, 700. He, he notes certain features of the Achaean troops, which are superior to those of the Trojan troops. And I would, I would venture to say that, yes, you could say that is because he has a biased view of the Greeks or the Achaeans. I would also say that there's a second option, which is that since he obviously would know Hellenic and Achaean culture better, he would know more of their virtues. And I would suggest even a third option, which is he wants to highlight the superior features of the people who win the war to give one an idea of that which enables one to be successful within the world. And I would say that that is, that's the clearest answer. Because um, Homer does give some interesting changes, uh, some interesting differences between the Trojans and the Greeks. For one, when they engage in combat mass large for the first time against each other early in the text, uh, book three, uh, right at the beginning, the Trojans are wild, they're loud, they scream as they enter battle. Attempting, sort of like you might imagine, like sort of an animal com- engaging in combat with another, uh, uh, like shooting up its feathers or something like that in order to intimidate. But the Achaeans, they're grim and silent. And what does that mean about them? Well, let's, let's add this to another aspect of them. When first forming their troops, so we see them, the wisest counselor of the Achaeans, Nestor, he's an old man by this time. He's essentially the wise old man who's seen so many battles and been so successful that everything he says is essentially correct. And we do not listen to him at our own peril. But at Near the end of book two, when the Achaeans and the Trojans are preparing for their first combat in the text, and this is sort of introducing to us the idea of combat in this text and the idea of the first battle that must have occurred between the Trojans and the Achaeans, although, and I should note this, the Iliad does not start until the tenth year of the Trojan War. And so... Everything we see for the first time will model the first time it must have happened in Troy, although it will be happening for, well, what could be the infinite time that something happened. Well, in any case, or you might also see it as, as lo- even when things happen for a long time, unique events still pop up and occupy sort of an endless or infinite space and that they are completely novel in that moment, and you could have never seen them coming. Sort of like a snake in the grass, or the idea of uh, cancer, the astrological sign, as, as a crab. And so, Nestor suggests that the men who are known cowards be kept in the middle ranks of the Achaean soldiers. And what does this do? Why does he say that? Well, he says that so that they can't run away, so that they have to fight hard. So there's a principle of order and structure to the Achaean army. They structure their army in an intelligent way, recognizing not only the strengths, but the weaknesses of their own men. That's a strength of them. They're also so well disciplined that even in the face of wild and screaming Trojans about to engage in the most dangerous game, they maintain the, their their disciplined silence. And one might understand that these are advantages that the Achaeans have. They have learned more self-restraint. They have learned more discipline. And so one would expect that they will experience more success because of this. And in fact, well, <laughs> early in book three, the combat comes to an end for a moment. It stopped. So that an Achaean champion, Menelaus, from whom Helen, the whole reason this war is starting, was stolen, has started, excuse me, was stolen. Well, Menelaus gets to fight one-on-one against the man who stole his girl, Paris of Troy. And you might, and so you might well 
understand Menelaus to stand for the average Achaean versus Paris, the average Trojan. And so let me, let me take a moment to describe them. Homer is not much for physical appearances and the description of them. Occasionally in the Iliad, he, he will describe brutally the deaths of individuals and get into the, the underlying physiology of that. Various tongues will get knocked out of faces, heads will get cut off and roll like logs. He'll describe them as, uh, people's arms will get cut off. Uh, yeah, people will be stabbed through various organs. However, in terms of physical description, he, he very often does not describe his heroes. We know that Odysseus, cunningest of the Achaeans, is broad-shouldered and not super tall, and has a dumb look on his face while he thinks. Menelaus is rather tall with red hair, with broad shoulders as well, but not as broad as Odysseus is. Um, Ajax the Greater, or Aias the Greater as I will call him, um, he is known to be the tallest and also the most beautiful of the Achaeans, except for Achilleus, who is the fastest, uh, tallest, and and most beautiful. But that that's the only physical description you really get of them. Your imagination so, sort of tells you what beauty is, whether it looked like what 8th century uh, Hellenes would have believed was beautiful or whether you think of Brad Pitt from that atrocious Troy movie. Well, that's sort of up to you. And in fact, Homer <laughs> Homer's longest description of physical appearance is the description of the ugliest man in <laughs> the Iliad, which is a man named Thersites, who, who we will soon come back to. Well, so what we know about Menelaus is that he's a tall, noble-looking king, and he fights honorably and has a good heart, as often following Agamemnon about. So he represents the Achaeans, because the Achaeans follow Agamemnon. He is their war chief. He is their leader. He brought the most ships. He was the wealthiest. And so, boom, he became the king. That should sound pretty familiar to you. Um, <clears throat> Paris is the son of Priam, the emperor of Troy, son of Laomedon. Paris is contrasted with his brother Hector, who is himself a family man, a good man. His wife Andromache loves him. His son Astyanax will someday rule the city. He fights valiantly for problems he did not cause. We'll talk a lot about Hector. He is deeply noble and a very good man, though he fights on the wrong side of history, which could happen to any of us. And so why, why it is important to know the virtues of one's enemy, you might say. <sighs> And so Paris is quite the opposite of his brother, as you might expect with the old theme of the hostile brothers, Cain and Abel, Mufasa and Scar, <laughs> Hector and Paris, Loki and Thor, um, Jesus and Lucifer in the paradise lost sense. Well, in this case, Paris is a cowardly, beautiful, joking or cajoling weakling. And, well, that's not actually quite right, and it makes it a little bit worse to understand that Paris is very much beautiful and gifted by Aphrodite. He's a pretty boy. Every woman loves him, and that's why Helen, most beautiful woman ever to have existed, is seduced by him, <clears throat> with perhaps a little help from Aphrodite, but we'll explain what Aphrodite means as a symbol later. Essentially, the the erotic motivational system, you might say, the tendency towards lust and love. So Paris goes out onto the battlefield wearing a leopard skin. A leopard skin. You might say that that is a mark of status and a mark of uh, high fashion at this time, but also a mark of a non-functional outfit. Where is he? War. What is he not wearing? Armor. What is he? Sort of insipid, you might say. Sort of gaudy. Sort of focused on the superficial rather than the substantial. The things you can see rather than that which you cannot see. And you would, we might say that that's the major difference between the Achaeans and the Trojans. Focus on the substantial versus the superficial. So we actually ran out of time fairly fast. 
today, and I didn't even get a chance really to introduce the very beginning of the Iliad, but I have outlined some major differences between the Achaeans and the Trojans, stipulated what is happening at the beginning of the Iliad in the Trojan War, the combat between Achaeans and Trojans, over what is the casus belli, the cause of war. Well, it was the theft of Helen of Sparta, formerly Helen of Argos, by Paris, young son of Priam of Troy, who actually had a fate to do this, uh, and we'll talk about the role of fate in the ancient texts. Um, ad, ad nauseum, you might say, um, uh, but also probably ad se- sapientiae as well. Um, and we talked about the major differences in character and attitude between the Trojans and the Achaeans, and from understanding these distinctions, we will be able to move forward in a coherent and intelligent way. In the next podcast, we'll talk about we'll talk about the very beginning of the Iliad, how it sets up the action of the plot, and um, we'll encounter our first unknown situation which breaks a safe space and shows actually the poisonous consequences of maintaining a safe space without understanding that nature and entropy and felt your fellow man can break in on that on in any given time and uh insofar as you you do not understand that you can react in a very 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 negative and hurtful way not only to yourself but to your society at large and Achilles when he is snubbed by Agamemnon and effectively enters space he's never been in before well, he does something that's deeply hurtful, not only to his entire people, but ultimately to himself as well. So thank you for listening. Please subscribe. Please listen in. Please post your comments. Please, please share these podcasts and listen to them. And if you have any questions or comments, please share. It's really great to hear from any of you. And honestly, I'm a person just like you are. I love the affirmation. So, let me know. This has been the Alexander Schmidt Podcast. Have a great day. The audio you just heard was recorded in Anchor. Learn more at anchor.fm.